really odd. Hi there, everybody. Um, so as, as many of you know, I have more or less retired. And one of the nice things about retiring is you, you get to think about the big picture for a while. And, and so, and so I was doing a talk uh, last year at Agile 2022, I guess, Agile 2022 in, in uh, Nashville. And as part of the track they made up years ago for Ron Jeffries and me, which was uh, uh, old guys that they want to have come and talk. And so I I put together a little talk that was, you know, what, looking back over the past 27-ish years of uh, of what I've been doing and what we've been doing and in in what we now call Agile. And, and kind of reflecting on... on what we've done and and maybe what we we should have done differently and and so I, I call this uh, what we've learned so far by we I mean me um and so I've given this talk I gave this talk there in in Nashville I gave it uh last October in in Lisbon Portugal which is why I had slides I made up five slides for it uh, for my little half hour talk, uh, the guy before me and his, for his little half hour talk had 72 slides, uh, but I only had five and I think, uh, I think that's better. Uh, but anyway, um, so I really thought there were, there were three things that stood out in, in what I think we should have done differently in this thing we call, we call Agile. Uh, the first of those, first of these three things, is that that we taught answers instead of how to derive answers. Uh, and so you see this through the training that people like me and and other folks have done, which is teaching people some way of working. Uh, whether it's extreme programming or Kanban or Scrum or whatever those things are, uh, we said, here's what you should do. And I think that was wrong. I think we've done a disservice by doing that. Because what works for me and my team of particular people in a particular place with a particular problem may not work for you and the people you're working with and the place you're working and the problem you're trying to solve. And certainly lots of those things have evolved over the past 20, some 25, 27 years. Uh, and so and so the, the the solutions that we came up with and wrote about and teach about over the past 25, 20, you know, over 30 years in the case of Scrum uh, aren't maybe not the most valuable to people. And the thing we should have done was teach you all a kind of process, the kind of process that, that we went through in the invention of extreme programming. Uh, we tried lots and lots of things. And those that worked for us, we codified into this thing called XP. And those that didn't, we didn't. And we didn't even say very much about those things because they didn't work for us. And that's kind of arrogant. What works for us will work for you. And, and that's probably not what we should have done. Uh, a few minutes ago, Anna was talking about uh, a Kanban class. Well, we tried a process very, very similar to Kanban. Uh, we stopped doing iterations and started doing what, what we called a uh, flow. And uh, we just, we didn't like it. We didn't like it. Uh, and because we didn't like it, it's not part of extreme programming. 
But it turns out that that's a really good way to work for a lots of our problems. And so that's something we really ought to have in our toolbox is the ability to work in an iterative sprint kind of way. And also the ability to work in this continuous flow kind of way. And, and however we work, we should make a decision about is this what we should do or is that what we should do? And we should base that decision on some experimentation. Let's try this and let's try that and reflect on which of them worked for us. One of the things that we used to be very militant about was the use of pair programming. Uh, when we first started working, uh, we worked individually like lots of folks do. And then and then there came a day when we had some kind of little problem. I actually, it was uh, 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 something I was working on and I, I built some some code uh, uh, to, to do something and I wasn't happy with how it turned out. And one of the things that our coach Kent Beck had mentioned was this working in pairs. And so I grabbed another of our teammates, uh, another one of my, one of my teammates, uh, Ed and Derry, turns out is his name. <clears throat> I said, Ed, Ed, work with me on this and let's see if we can do better because I don't like how it turned out. And let's see if we think this is an interesting way to work. And so Ed and I spent a day or two rebuilding the thing I didn't think I did a very good job on. And we came up with something much, much better than what I had done. Because it turns out that the constraint in the kind of work most of us do is not how fast you type, it's how fast you think. And two brains think faster than one. Uh, and two brains together probably think faster than two brains separately. And so we reported to our team immediately that we did this and it worked really well. We all should try this. And our whole team, our whole team uh, went off and the next the next iteration, we, we practiced this pair programming thing. And, and we all found it to be very, very useful. And we adopted that as something we did from then on. And when we went to teach other people about XP, we, we said, you got to do this pair programming because it's so great. That was another arrogant move. Because what we should have said was, here's this thing you should try and see if it works for you. There's things we tried that, that we rejected. Um, what are the, 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 the godfather of Agile, the guy whose ideas really are the foundation of all this stuff, really, is a guy named Ward Cunningham. And Ward was, was playing with this practice called literate programming. And the idea was that, that your program would be a story. And embedded in the story would be the source code. And the story would be in com be a big comment that wrapped around everything you did. And you could just read this whole thing. And if, if you've ever looked at uh, uh, one of Ron Jeffrey's articles about whatever he's working on, you should do that. Uh, look at ronjeffries.com. You'll see his articles are this narration of what he's thinking and what he's trying and the code embedded in that. And that's kind of what a literate program looks like. And so we tried this for a week or so, and we absolutely hated it. It was just, it just felt like we were slugging our way through mud trying to do this. And so, no, we actually, we didn't even try it for a week. We did this for a couple of days and said, no, we can't stand this. And we stopped it immediately. But that doesn't mean it won't work for you. And so, and so really what we should have done is, is, taught people a process and let them figure out how to experiment, maybe give them hints on things you should try. Here's way more things than you should do and, and pick out the ones that work for you. And it doesn't matter if they're the same as what we did or the same as what some team down the hall is doing or across town is doing. Because what works for you and the folks you're working with is what you should do. And not worry that if somebody changes teams, they'll have a little bit of learning curve because learning's good. Learning is, is not a, 
something we should avoid. Learning is something we should seek out. And that's that's one of the most important things. I see somebody had a, a question about, about user stories. And that's something that we, we adopted very, very early on. Uh, this idea that that our business partner, what an XP we call customer, her name was Marie Diarmit, uh, would communicate with us uh, on a constant basis. She was a member of the team. We, we She sat with us. And we eventually moved into the payroll department. We just we were surrounded by the payroll folks, and and they would explain to us what they wanted the payroll system to do. They would tell us stories about an employee who worked so many hours at this pay rate and all this kind of stuff, and 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 we would write programs to make that happen. And so, and so storytelling is, is really the fundamental basis of human interaction. Uh, we have been telling stories to communicate ideas for, for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, one of the, an interesting book you should look at is about Storytelling in Business Situations by Steve Denning. Uh, uh, he, tells an, he tells interesting stories about how he changed how the World Bank was working. He wanted to help, he was an, a senior executive at the World Bank and he wanted to modernize how the World Bank did stuff. And he looked around about how to convince other people of, of new ideas. And he discovered that the way you do that is through storytelling. Now, in, in XP, we kind of formalized that. And we, 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 we created a little shorthand for these stories. We, we broke them down eventually and discovered that there's three parts to a user story. Uh, uh, the most important part is that conversation. That's the important thing. The conversation you have with the business person. You probably need, well, I'm gonna say you probably, you do need some way to verify, to validate that you did what they asked you to do, to add some rigor to that process. We call that confirmation. Uh, we turn that into automated tests. That we could verify that this did what we, that we were asked to do. And then you might find that you need uh, some artifact to help tracking and do business, do uh, uh, project management kind of stuff. And we call that card because we did that on index cards. But today, a lot of people use, you know, some tool, uh, an abomination like uh, Jira is very popular if you're into abominations. Uh, but that's not the important part. That's not the user story. The thing you type into Jira is not a story. What your customer, what your product owner says to you and the conversation you have, that's the story. What you type into Jira is just the way you're remembering what that is. Uh, a friend of mine said that the, the that that's, that's like a vacation photo. The thing you type into Jira is like a vacation photo. It reminds you of something you did on vacation. It's not the vacation, though. And it turns out you don't even have to have the photos to remember the vacation. And so here's a place where we should we should try different things and see what works for us. Do we do we need that artifact? Or can we get away without it? Do we need a whole lot of information in that artifact? Or should we make it sparse so that we go back and ask questions again? I just I just had an interesting experience uh, about, I suppose, requirements gathering. Um, I get, uh, those of you who know me a little bit know that I'm a trap shooter. I shoot, I shoot little clay targets and I get an email every now and then from the, the national organization, the amateur trap shooting association, telling me about upcoming events. And I moved about, I don't know, two years ago, two and a half years ago to, from, from Michigan to Georgia and I still get emails about shoots in Michigan, which are completely useless to me. 
And so I finally sent an email to somebody at the ATA saying, I don't want emails about Michigan. I want emails about Georgia. And we had an odd little email back and forth about whether this was possible to change where I got information about. But it just seems to me that if, if someone sat down, a programmer and a, and a product owner kind of person and said, you know, we're going to send out emails to members who ask for them telling them about upcoming events. And we're going to grab their address and we're going to geocode it. And then we can look at the, where these things are and figure out what's within some radius of them. And that's what, that's what we'll tell them about. I find it really hard to believe that no one in that meeting didn't say, well, what happens when someone moves? Because that would be a natural thing to talk about when you're sitting around a table talking about how you want this thing to work. What happens when somebody moves? But apparently they did this by semaphore. And so the bandwidth was really, really small. And the, the question about what happens when somebody moves hadn't come up, apparently, until I said, I moved. And now I'm getting the wrong emails. And as best I could tell, they were going to fix it by hand. Which didn't seem like the right solution to the problem. And so the power of user story is the conversation. So the programmer can say, what happens when somebody moves? You want me to keep sending them Michigan, even though they live in Georgia? Or should I change them? And the, and, the, and the product owner, the customer, the business person would say, are you stupid? I want, they should, it should reset when they move. Because that's how we learn things. We don't learn by reading entries and things like Jira. We learn by having conversations and challenging each other. And that's how our process should work. We should challenge each other and try to learn what works better for us. We should stop every now and then and look at how we're working and figure out how to improve. We got so focused on improvement that we actually brought in a little kitchen timer and set it for 10 minutes. And every 10 minutes when the little timer went off, we wrote down what we were doing at that moment so that we could look back over a few days to see how we spent our time every day. Because how can you improve if you don't know what you're doing? And so we made this, this really concerted effort to figure out what we were doing every day. And we found interesting things. That, that apparently some people speak, drink a lot of coffee and they have to go to the men's room a lot. And, but you don't know what you find until you look. You don't know what you find until you look. And so what we should have done is put in the hands of folks ways to discover a way to work that work best for them as opposed to telling people what worked good for us 25 years ago. That's, I think that's the most important thing, I believe. <clears throat> the, the second thing that I think is important is a mistake we made for a couple of reasons. When we first started telling folks about XP, one of the comments we would get back, one of the pieces of pushback we would get back <clears throat> would be that, that in order for this to work, you would have to have really good programmers. And we would always say no, that, that we were just these guys and gals, there were men and women on our team, we were just the, these people who mostly a couple of years ago had been COBOL programmers. And now we've turned into this group of really good object-oriented programmers. And, and, but we didn't do anything magical. We weren't, we weren't, we weren't, you know, 
uh, uh, on the far end of the of the spectrum, we thought. And it turns out that we misled people because it turns out we were on the far end of the spectrum for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is that we spent a huge amount of effort figuring out how to be really, really good. Uh, we were trained by world-class people. The people who went on to write books about how you do this were the folks that we worked with. Uh, uh, I was taught uh, object modeling by the guy who went on to be the chairman of the UML committee. Uh, I was taught uh, design uh, by Martin Fowler, who went on to write several books about, about design, and by Kent Beck, who's one of the great thought leaders in the world of software development, and by Ron Jeffries, who uh, will tell you that he has written every program that could possibly be thought of. I mean, that's nearly true, because I know he's done everything from invent a uh, time-sharing operating system uh, to creation of relational databases, to writing the software that would have run a nuclear war had we decided to blow up the world. Uh, luckily, a lot of his stuff didn't, didn't have to ship, at least that last one. And we hung out with people who were really, really good. And we thought everybody had the same level of skill we did. And it turns out that's not where we are today. The, the number of software developers increases incredibly. It, it doubles every couple of years, which means that, that the half the programmers you work with have less than two years of experience. And if they have not been trained If effort, huge effort has not been put into training them on the right way to do work, they're never going to be very good because they've never seen what really good is. And so, and so we said, no, we just think we're average guys. And I think we were just average folks. But we had put in a huge effort to learn how to get good. And it turns out, unless the folks who do the actual work are good and know what good work is, the chances of you getting good outcomes is pretty small. You're relying on luck and luck is not a strategy. And so wherever you are, you need to put effort in to increasing the skill level of the peoples on your team. And that might be through formal training, that might be through just setting time aside every week for them to share what they've learned and to work together to learn new things. Uh, when we were first learning this, uh, the guy we worked for, uh, uh, Tom Hatfield, uh, asked us, uh, I didn't, ask, he asked in the way that your manager asks you to do things, if you know what I mean, that every week we catalog at least one thing we learned that week. So we had a big list of all the things the whole team had learned on and on, which meant that we focused on learning things. We paid attention to learning things. And we shared what we learned so that the entire team came up together. That takes a little bit of time to do that. And if we're focused on just creating as many story points as possible, we're not going to do that. What we need to do is focus on building a team and teams that can work together, that have skills and learn and know how to share skills among themselves and bring the ship up so that everybody is better at the end of every week and they know things, they know the things they know today that they didn't know last week and are able to share those things across the team. Because this is hard. And this, unless, you can, unless you can really, really do 
the work well, the work won't be done well. So that's, that's number two. First is think about how to learn to be better. Think about how to build your own process, not just pick one up from a class, from a book, from a whatever. Build the process around you and your problems and your teams. The second is focus on the technical skills that are required to do the work well. You, you don't walk into a symphony, a, a world-class symphony orchestra, and see the musicians trying to figure out how to tune their instruments and how to play the music. They know that. It's, it's built into their fingers by the time you get there. And that's how you need your programmers to be. The third and the last of these three things is think big. Think about the big picture. Think about solving big, hard problems and do that work in the smallest step you can imagine. However, whatever the size of the steps you are taking today, make them smaller. There's, 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 no, there's no small granularity that's too small as far as I'm concerned. I try to figure out how to make the smallest move possible that has some feedback that I can use to learn. And then I think, could I have done it in a smaller step? Uh, my friend G. Paul Hill says we want many, many more, much, much smaller steps. And so break things down as small as possible. 27 years ago, working in a block of time, a month or three weeks or whatever, two weeks, was, was mind-boggling to folks because they were used to going off and working on things that took six months or, or two years to accomplish. And we learned how to accomplish something in just a few, couple of weeks. But now I wanna learn how to accomplish something in just a couple of days or just a couple of hours because I want to learn as fast as possible. And it's that small piece gives you the opportunity to look at what you've done and reflect on what you've done and to learn. And, and that means you need to be reflecting at multiple levels because if I'm, I'm, if I'm working in four hour chunks, I'm gonna look at what I did over those four hours, but I'm gonna look at what I did over the last four of those four hours because you wanna see things at multiple levels and the thing that, that's not visible at the four hour level might be visible at the two day level. But you work at that small level and you, and you constantly think about how can I break things down even, even smaller? Because that means I get to learn faster. And that's an important, a, 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 a very, very important thing to do. So those are really the three things that I came to talk about. I think I think if we can take that into how we go about moving forward over the next 20 some years, I think I think we'll be in a better place than we are today and in a better place that that we thought we were going to be today. At least I thought we were going to be today as opposed to where we are right now, which in some cases seems like we've made no progress at all. Anyway, that's that's what I got to say. I'm happy to talk about anything that anybody else has as my cats go wandering through. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if you all want to either A, raise your hand or B, put something in chat, um, go for it. Um, one, one of the things, I guess, a couple of questions I had right off the bat, uh, especially when you when you talked about number three, thinking in the biggest picture possible and breaking that down into the smallest pieces imaginable, right? Um, and you talk about a lot of teams now are on either, let's say, one week, two week sprints, things like that. So when you're making reference to three, 
I've heard you personally tell stories in the past about how you have shipped, you know, your your time frame of uh, sprints down to even like a day, right? Uh, in the past, and so or less. yeah, less or less. And is that is that more so what you're thinking about? Is that it's it's not the when you mentioned learn faster, it's it's the loop of feedback that you're learning from, right? It is, it is, you know, and and whether it is about the product, you know, the the fundamental business value you're trying to deliver, mm -hmm. uh, how much feedback can I get? How quickly can I get feedback as to whether I am solving somebody's real problem or not, how, or how much of that real problem am I solving? To to how do I actually go about creating that solution? And can I build that solution in a way that is a bunch of small ideas strung together in a way that where I have lots of lots of endpoints that allow me to determine and learn whether the solution I am building is really the right solution uh, for the business problem? Um, if I was trying to to change how we went about working. Uh, I wouldn't come up with a big grandiose plan of where we want to be a year from today. I would come up with a little bit of thing we can do today that'll have us operating differently tomorrow. So I can see if that's the right path. Now, when you when you think about that, um, people usually get concerned about a local optima, right? I, I've solved this local problem, but I don't I don't get to see the big problem way over there. And so that's one of the reasons you have to stop and take a look at the big picture and say, okay, I've I've I have a I'm in an optimum position here, but I'm gonna have to change things in order to be able to get to there. And that's just part of the whole process of looking at where you are and looking at the big, biggest picture you can see. So you have to do that at every level. And then going back to to one here, um, I think for me over the years, this is probably the largest takeaway that I've had from either any conversations I had, any um, training sessions I've attended, um, is <clears throat> essentially what you're saying when we taught answers, teach the process instead. You're saying... Teach how to ask questions. As as an as an educated person in this field, you have the knowledge to do that. What works for you, and not follow, because Chet said story points are really important. We have to follow this. <laughs> to follow this exactly. And I, I use I use that example purpose on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's something that really hits home for me is that. Um, I don't think, you know, in the whole process of agility is that there, there is no right path. There is no, this person does it the best. Like when you're looking at it just at face value, it's always compared to really the person that is, is leading that. But also what you said with number two there, the entire technical skills required to do the work, your team makeup. Um, and so using the story points as an example um, versus what was taught and thinking about, well, we should have taught this process. Like, how do you get someone to, without telling them is that when, and what you've said recently at our open space is that like, you think story points are sort of dumb <laughs> um, to be honest. So what, what's that sort of process? It's not our best idea. Yeah. And so what's that, what's that process feel like for someone that wants to, open their mind to, well, I've been taught this, that story points are really important. Well, I maybe I should challenge that, or maybe I should think like what I have and maybe go about it a different route. Well, I think, I think it goes back to focusing on outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Story point is a technique mm -hmm. or something. And if we can't agree as to what that something is, then maybe story point isn't the right answer because we can't even agree on it as to what the question is, right? And I think I think that's the first step at any level. 
You know, there's, there's, at, 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 when it comes to, okay, we need to have some way of figuring out about how much work we're going to get done in the next couple of days. Well, somebody should probably say, what are we going to do with that information? Right. Well, it's, well, it's okay. The business people over here need to know how much money to go get. And that information will help them extrapolate how much money to go get. Okay. That's a reasonable thing to do. How can we figure out how much money they should go get? Well, there's six of us and we get paid this much and this problem looks about this big. So we need about that much money. Okay. And if something helps us figure out about how big this problem is, and that thing is like a story point, that's solving some prop, some real purpose. But 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 we should never use some tool as its own justification, right? We should always be thinking about what is it we're trying to accomplish, and whether that is uh, at the small level from some very small technique like story point or test driven development or pairing or whatever those kinds of things are. We always want to think, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Then we also want to think about, okay, what 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 is the real problem we're trying to solve? What's what's the thing that the people want with the money want from us, so that so that they have the thing they want and we have the money, and we figure out what that is. Because because if you think about it, if we if we couch every decision we make in terms of what's going to get those people to give us money sooner, that might help us focus our mind in a much, much different way. Uh, going back to my friend Hill uh, with the, the many, many more, much, much smaller steps guy, uh, G. Paul Hill, uh, he, one of his reasons to do test-driven development is what he calls the money proposition. Because we get paid for, for solving business problems with code and if we solve that problem faster and better, they'll give us the money sooner. And therefore, test-driven development is about getting the money sooner. You know, and, and you know, the, uh, one of the things we programmers say is that, that we would program uh, even if they weren't paying us, which may be true. But if they weren't paying us, this isn't what I'd be programming. I'd be programming something else. Yeah, and so the money is what gets us to program the thing they want, not the thing we think will be fun to build. So, so we always want to look at the big picture about okay, what is what problem are we trying to solve? What will cause them to give us the money sooner? Might be an interesting way of thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, thinking about it from that perspective, verse um, one, you're you're looking at the value to almost the stakeholders there and how you're communicating. What do you think in terms of like true internal team, just siloed um, scrum team, like what's the best, the best way to do estimation for a team, regardless of outside business factors or whatever that might be. And it's an adaptation of a question that we had that run that came into chat there. Um, so let's say that we want to get rid of story points because we're tracking velocity, but what the heck does that even like, you know, who, who's even utilizing that? What's happening? Um, we want to know the true, the, the true estimation of, of, of effort um, that works for our team in order to know that we can do X, Y, and Z in this sprint time frame um per se well you know the one of the things i remember from grad school and if i had been really really good at that i would i'd be a uh probably an economist at goldman sachs instead of whatever it is i am um but but one of the most fundamental uh, uh, truths is you really ought, you ought to measure the thing you want and and if I want to know how fast I am solving problems 
I try to figure out how to measure the rate I'm solving problems. And breaking them down to a fine grain into small pieces and measuring the flow of them across some period of time would be the way I would do that. You know, one of the one of the things we used to talk about um, is that if you want to know uh, uh, how many cars are going down the road, you don't count the cars. You count the wheels because that gives you more data. And if you miss one wheel, it won't impact the answer as much as missing one car. <laughs> And so, and so I want to break things down small. And if I break things down small, as long as it still solves a visible piece of the problem and isn't just work, because I don't want to count work. I want to, I want to count outcome. I want to count value. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to measure. And so, and so that's why I, I recommend breaking user stories or whatever you have down into small pieces because that that gives us a better way of of seeing the flow and it gives our business partners better tools to decide what they want now what they want later and what they want never because if they want if they come in and ask for this huge monolithic thing that'll take two years to build well, I'm not going to give them anything of value for two years if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. If we break that down into little bitty pieces, the, you know, 500 little bitty pieces, well, tomorrow I... Tomorrow Chet's going to do something. I'm assuming that cut off for everyone else. Becomes irrelevant. Right. <laughs> Did I go away? You went away. Yeah. You went oh. away for about thirty seconds. Oh, I says my internet connection is unstable, which is really odd because my lovely uh, uh, fiber optic should be fine. <laughs> I got, I got, I got fiber. Come on, guys, and I'm hardwired here to fiber. I, th I think I'm hardwired. You never know. Well, no, I'm on Wi-Fi for some reason. Why am I on Wi-Fi? Yeah, we have a fancy picture of you in a tux up now. I look really good in a tuxedo. No, yeah. Doesn't look bad, Chad. There we go. I break that out on special occasions. I, I bought that because I belong to this really fancy uh, 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 country club in Michigan. Uh, me and the president of General Motors belong to this really fancy country club back in Michigan. So you got to dress up when you're hanging out with the president of General Motors. You still getting emails from that country club? I No. I, we stopped paying them and they stopped sending emails. They're not like the other guys. <laughs> That's good stuff. Does anybody want to raise their hand, um, ask something directly, and feel free if we're not, you know, on the topic of sort of what we've learned, you know, anything, Chet's here. I'll talk about anything, you know me. Yeah, um, there's literally <laughs> anything you could ask. So, yeah, we got a hand raised there, Scott, if you want to unmute. Yeah. I hey, Scott, how you doing? Good, good. Glad to see you again. I missed going to the last... Uh conference so uh i'll, I'll probably never be actually i'm, I'm uh, only what i'm going to is the one in portugal because it's fun yeah that's a nice place to go <laughs> um but i i put in chat i'd heard that ron apologized for story points on a couple uh, of we are on youtube apologizing for story points yeah years ago <laughs> um but what do you think might be a useful way to do um estimation for a team to begin to get some idea what their ability to deliver might be well, like I said, you know, if you're working in small little pieces, you just count how much you're delivering. You know, the thing about a story point is there's uh, it's the wrong end of the stick. Yeah. You know, if if you know your stick at one end has cost and the other has value, we want to be focusing on the value end of the stick, not the cost end of the stick. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because I work with a couple of teams that decided for themselves. But rather than spending time in story point estimation sessions, they would spend time in story point breakdown sessions. And they broke everything down into small pieces. And then for the people who wanted points, everything was a two. 
So they they gave people the points if people wanted points from them, but everything was the same size, so everything got the same number, and they didn't waste their time on estimation that way. Well, I tell people I use the Fibonacci sequence. I just stop at one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same thing, you know. Two and one, you know. If you just, if it becomes the unit and everything's that size, then it might as well be a one. You could call it a 37, but it wouldn't make any difference. They're all the same. So, yeah. you know, if they're small enough, you can count how many go by. Thank and that you. lets you focus on value. Yeah. You know, I, I, I worked with a company last year that's uh, 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 actually based in, in Portugal. And they, they're a, they're a you know, a, shop, a, a job shop. And they, they got a contract with a big company in Portugal. And they were being paid by the story point. It's like it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And of course, what they were calling story points was really more of a function point. And we stopped doing that 20 years ago. So. That'd be a good, great contract, right? Yeah, it was crazy. It's crazy. So. But I had to, you know, it's like, okay, you know, you know, we all know how I feel about that. We'll just ignore that. You got you guys got this job you got to do, and that's how you work, and that's okay. You know. Uh, but I want to, I want to, I want to. Uh, no, it was uh, a Meadowbrook Country Club, not Open Hills. Do you see uh, that one above, Chad? Uh, and I had to step away for 30 seconds, but say, how do you find the balance between breaking <laughs> things down so small and not so small that your team spend half their time tracking them in Jira? Um, less Jira, more Jenkins. Less Jira, more Jenkins. You know, there's no nothing on earth that makes that guarantees that Jira is telling the truth. But when the acceptance test runs in your Jenkins build, you know you have something working now that wasn't working before. And so I wouldn't worry about that. You know, I, uh, you know, when, when a few years ago, uh, Ron and I did a talk about how we would do XP today, and and I came up with something I called 12 uh, because when Kent came up with XP, he said, what we want to do is turn uh, the dials up to 11 uh, using the, the spinal tap metaphor, turn the amp up to 11 on the things that were good and important and down to zero on the things that don't help as much. And I said, well, let's go one more. Let's go to 12. And so uh, I tried to figure out how to get rid of everything you don't really, really have to have. And one of those things was estimates. Uh, you don't really need estimates. Uh, I actually got rid of, also got rid of the backlog. Uh, so I also got, I got rid of iterations. I got rid of everything. You just work, get together and decide what you're going to do right now. So. In a vacuum, that sounds great. Yeah. But Ron has a little article about it. You can probably find it uh, at Ron Jeffries. Um, got three minutes left. Um, feel free to ask golf questions. I don't play golf. I, I just I just uh, sit on the patio and watch people play golf. Oh. Hey, Chad, I'm not sure if I know how to pronounce this, as we know I have pronunciation difficulties. Sure. What do you think of, because I did all, um, my one of my trainers did a presentation last week on this topic. Um, so it was AI and security, but he like spent three hours a night, like at the, with the chat GPT. And he was showing how, like, if you put in bad code, it'll immediately fix it. And he said, he really know, doesn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, you know, of course, the, the, as I said, you know, as I always say, you know, that the typing isn't the constraint, it's the thinking. Now, I have been around a long time. And I remember back in the 80s when they had these wonderful tools that were going to replace all these programmers and all you had to do was specify exactly what you wanted in an unambiguous way. And this program could generate the, the system to do that. It's not the generation of the code. That's the hard part. 
It's the figuring out what it is they want. Mm. You know, it's the nobody nobody said anything about what happens when somebody moves. The chat GPT isn't going to say what happens when somebody moves. They're not going to do the what happens when somebody does this. Yeah, you know, if if you can specify unambiguously what it is you want, then yeah, that can generate some code for you. But so can a programmer. And the code that the programmer generates will be readable by other humans, hopefully, and modifiable by other humans later on when your needs change. You know, and so and so as you look at this, you know, the my, my the people I know who are playing with it in, in software development circles are way unimpressed by what comes out. Oh, of it. really? Now that doesn't mean that it won't be better, but but you know, it's it's uh, somebody <laughs> today on on Mastodon, which is what I use today, Mastodon. Uh, said when somebody says we're should we have AI do this? Uh, substitute weasel for that. Should we have a bunch of weasels do this for us? And if it still makes sense, then it'd be okay for the AI to do. But if it doesn't make sense for the weasels to do, should we have the weasels build us a system that will do this solve solve our big business problem for us? No, I'm not going to trust the weasels to do that. <laughs> you know? And let's have the weasels doing work in somebody else's building do it, right? Let's 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 have the let's have the computer that's doing this own be owned by somebody else and have the and, and turn over all of our business problems to them. That doesn't sound like something I'm going to invest in. <laughs> yeah, we're not not quite there yet, but um well, he did say that. He um, put something in about users, right? Like end users, and it thought it spewed out stuff about like drug users yeah. instead. Yeah. Well, the you know that there's lots of issues being created by this, you know, because you know if if you go out and have it generate you a scientific paper. It will generate the paper and all these footnotes for all the references, and it turns out it makes all of it up. And so we're going to end up with a lot of, of things that we think are, are knowledge that are actually based on something that the, that the AI thought would be a good idea for somebody to have written a paper about, and so they just met, pretended that somebody had and and I think the software it's writing is kind of like that, you know. You know, we've 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 my little group on Tuesday nights has played with it, and said, you know, generate me a program to do this, and it's not the program you want. So, so I, it, I of course you know I'm I'm sixty five years old, so I don't care anymore. But uh, but I don't I don't think that's going to solve today's problems. No, I mean, learning from the it'll best, just generate right? a different kind. Not, not yet, at least. Um, <laughs> it's, it's getting there. Um, uh, yeah, let me know if, when, when you're ready to turn everything over to the weasels. I'll, I'll let you know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's going to get there for start. It'll be a companion. Um, the best way to to look at it there. So, well, you know, we we've gone from writing machine code to writing Kotlin. You know, and so this, but still going to have to be, have somebody who can actually specify what it is we want in some way that is enough specific to get the thing you actually want. So that's why if uh, some of you are looking for a new career path, I see very high dollars for prompt and prompt engineers. <laughs> so, um, yep, feel free to go down that. So we're we're past time here. Um, I know I have to run myself. Uh, I really do appreciate everyone joining. This will be recorded. Um, Chad, it's, it's Chad, great. thank you. You're Always. welcome. Um, hopefully, you know, you said you're not going to be at any conferences, but hopefully the next time we have one, 
Uh, you'll you'll slip down. So There's a good, good chance I'll come up for that, or you know, no. come, come to Lisbon in, in early October. That's so. a possibility as well. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you, thank always, Ted. It's so great to see, to see you. you and thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye bye. Um, thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Chet. Bye bye. Thank you.